Hi, this is Ron Sipsik, and in this segment we're going to take a look at another case of market distortion. In this case we're going to be looking at what is called a price floor. A price floor is just an example of a case where government policy has distorted market outcomes. We know that when a freely operating market uh, operates, it tries to move towards equilibrium. Equilibrium is not only the destination of most markets, it's also the place where societal surplus is actually maximized. I don't know if you're hearing that knocking. We have very, very loud mice in this building. So if you hear that knocking, um, just know that it's the mice and uh, nobody's getting hurt here. Okay? Back to our regular programming. Uh, we're taking a look at a price floor. A price floor is a government imposed price below which, below which, note the below here, below which the market may not legally operate. So in other words, the government is actually trying to prevent the price from falling to market equilibrium. The intent here is to keep prices artificially high. You say, why would government ever want to do that? Well, clearly, government is trying to uh, benefit the producer in this case. Now, the example we're going to use is something called the minimum wage law. The interesting thing about the minimum wage law is we're talking about a labor market. And in this particular case, let me just go ahead and move the model up so you can see it. In the case of a labor market, the supplier, the supplier is actually what? The workers or the employees and the demander would be the employers. Okay? So the supplier of labor would be workers, the demander of labor would be employers. Now I'm assuming that the market we're looking at is a market called the unskilled teenage labor market. So in other words, these people are relatively young, probably single, and relatively unskilled. So we might be looking at high school students or college students that are in their early years of college and they've not developed much of a work history. Okay. Now in this particular market, the market we're looking at, we're assuming that the equilibrium wage is six dollars per hour. Maybe this area is depressed. It's, uh, there's not a lot of demand for labor. Uh, if demand for labor is very, very weak, then the wage rate paid will be relatively low. So again, the idea is if the demand is weak, the demand curve is over to the left. If the demand curve is over to the left, the wage rate will be fairly depressed. So in the most depressed economic areas, in areas where there isn't much demand for labor, be it a city, be it a state, be it a nation, when the demand for labor is relatively weak, then the wage rate paid to that labor will be what? Relatively low. And this equilibrium wage rate is probably low by, by U.S. standards. Notice that when this market is in equilibrium, the amount of labor supplied, get rid of that, the amount of labor supplied equals the amount of labor demanded. So we have what we call an equilibrium condition. Notice this is L sub E. This is the quantity of labor supplied and the quantity of labor demanded equaling each other and that would be at 15,000 workers. So we're assuming that at $6 an hour, uh, uh, 15,000 people are willing to work at $6 an hour, and 16,000 workers are being demanded at that particular wage rate. That's the assumption. Now, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I'm getting excited here. Let me, let me erase that little mark up there. I always relish the idea of getting to use my erasing tool. It is a very, very fun tool to use. Okay, back to our midnight blue. So where does where does the minimum wage impose um, an, a, a distortion? That minimum wage or that price floor is going to impose a distortion if it's set where? If it's set above equilibrium. So this is W sub F. This is a wage floor, often called a minimum wage. Why? Because the wage is not allowed to go below that level legally. So we create a floor. Remember, a floor is a barrier you can't get below. And it's designed to keep the price from getting down to equilibrium. 
say that government in this particular uh, decides that in this particular geographic area, it could be a city government, it could be a state government. Again, uh, there's a federal minimum wage. It's important to note there's a federal minimum wage. States can go above the federal minimum. Cities can go above the state minimum. So the federal set sets the federal minimum wage sets the minimum minimum wage. The state minimum wage can be higher than the federal minimum, and the local minimum could be higher than the state minimum. All right, so uh, Seattle has a higher minimum uh, than the state of Washington, and the state of Washington has a higher minimum than the than the United States at the current at the time of this writing. All right, so let's say that the government in this particular city, maybe this is a particular uh, metropolitan area, imposes a, an eleven dollar minimum wage on employers. In other words, to legally employ someone you must pay that worker at least eleven dollars an hour. The effect of that is going to be twofold. One, at eleven dollars an hour more people are going to want to work. So labor supplied let's say jumps to 18k. So we have basically twenty percent more people wanting to work. Moving from 15 to 18 is a 20 percent increase. But but the number of workers demanded by employers actually decreases. There's a demand curve for labor. And at higher wages, employers don't want to hire as many people. You say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, if you don't agree with that, you're basically arguing against a demand curve for labor. And um, what I'm going to basically uh, encourage you to, to do is try to put forth a theory explaining why there's no demand curve for labor. And uh, the, the challenge you have is, is that there's gobs and gobs and gobs of economic research that supports the idea that there is a demand curve for labor. In fact, that's a fairly established economic foundation in microeconomic theory. All right, anyway, say that now there's only 12K or 12,000 workers demanded, which is actually a 20% decrease. 20% decrease. So I've got a 20% increase or a 3,000 worker increase in the amount of labor supplied, but I've got a 20% or 3,000K decrease in the amount of labor demanded. Well, what is this, what is this creating? This is creating a surplus, a surplus of labor. Now, you could look at it as a shortage of jobs, and we will look at it that way. But the way the diagram is drawn here, this is a surplus of labor equal to 6K. So in other words, there are 6,000 more people wanting to work at $11 an hour than there are jobs or positions for them to fill. Uh, the moral of the story is, here's the number of jobs. LD, LD defines the number of jobs. The number of jobs. LS defines the number of people looking for work. So in essence, you have a shortage of jobs, a surplus of labor. Now again, the way the model is drawn, we're going to call this a surplus of labor, which is also known, a surplus of labor is known as unemployment. I mean, after all, these people want to work. They want to work. They're looking for work. They're seeking work. They're available to work but they can't find work at the prevailing wage. So this is a surplus of labor or what we term unemployment. Now, who is going to get the jobs? Who, are going to, who is going to find these 12,000 jobs? Well, probably the policy was put in place for good reason. We have to believe that the intentions of the policymakers was good. That, in other words, they want to boost the incomes of uh, relatively unskilled, low-paid labor. So the object here is to boost incomes. The problem is there's a demand curve for labor. So when you push the way legal wage higher, let me just get rid of a mark. This is bugging me. When you get rid of that mark, things look better. Okay. So the, the minimum wage is, is applied to, to try to boost the incomes of unskilled, say, teenage labor. The problem is you've got a demand curve for labor, and employers are going to hire fewer units of labor. 
Now we have 18,000 people seeking 12,000 slots. Will these jobs end up going to the most disadvantaged? Highly unlikely. These jobs will likely go to connected people who tend not to be the most disadvantaged. In other words, you know, the kid who has a father who knows the, the owner of a company, that kid is going to have a lot better chance of finding a job than some disconnected kid walking in off the street. In fact, the disconnected kin, kid walking off the street may never even know the job exists because maybe the job isn't even posted. In other words, the, the fathers are talking and it turns out that the guy mentions who owns the business that he's looking for someone and the dad who has a son says, hey, I've got a son who's looking for work. And this all takes place without an advertisement or any sort of notice going out that, um, that there's a job available. By the way, many, 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 let me just repeat that, many jobs are never posted. They're never posted. The reason they're never posted is they can be rather easily filled through the connections that employers may already have. Employers, rather than trying to wade through hundreds of applications, would much prefer to work through recommend, the recommendations of a colleague. All right. So the point I'm trying to drive at here is that while the intent of the policy would probably be to, to boost the incomes of relatively poor, disadvantaged teenagers, they are probably the least likely to find work. Notice that there's 18,000 people seeking 12,000 jobs. Add to that the fact that there's basically a line, a queue, which means that when in doubt, employers are not going to hire people that don't look like them and don't seem to represent the same values. So in other words, this opens up an even wider door for labor market discrimination. You know, it's a lot harder for businesses to discriminate against labor when there's just enough labor out there to fulfill the, the slots that are open. But when there's lots of extra people applying for relatively few jobs, it's a lot easier to discriminate against someone because of their color, because of their ethnicity, because of their sexual orientation or their sex. Um, I mean, we could even get into ir irrelevant, very irrelevant characteristics like tattoos, and, um, and that could present, you know, you could have employers not hiring people because they don't like the tattoos that a person is wearing, even though those tattoos can be easily covered up in an employment situation. So the, the point is, surpluses of labor uh, make labor market discrimination even more likely. And that's one of the hidden costs of the minimum wage. All right, now let's go ahead and look at the, the effects of the minimum wage uh, on so, a societal surplus. So what I want to do is I want to run this diagram back down. And uh, I'm going to do some labeling up here. This area right here, I'm going to call A. I'm going to call this area here B. I'm going to call this area here C. So this is the area above the price line, 6. The wage rate is the price of labor below the demand curve for labor. And this area is what we call consumer surplus, A, B, and C. And then I'm going to take the area below, below the price line, and I want, to, I want to identify that area as well. So this area here we'll call D. In this area here, we'll call E. So D and E represent producer surplus. Who's, who gets producer surplus? That, goes to, that actually goes to the workers. Producer surplus goes to the workers, and that's D and E. So A, B, C is consumer surplus. D and E are producer surplus. Societal surplus is this entire area. Okay, so let's go ahead and scroll down and basically put that in our table. All right, so let me get my pen function going here. So consumer surplus is A, B, and C. Producer surplus is D and E. Societal surplus is A through E. Okay? And again, societal surplus is consumer surplus 
plus producer surplus, which equals societal surplus. Okay? Now, what effect does the wage floor, this artificially high price, have on the market? Let's take a look. All right, so let's go back up. This is a cool scrolling function. They wanted to make it hard for me so I could be especially adept at doing this. All right, so at, at a wage rate of 11, what are what are consumers of labor businesses going to get? Well, they're only going to demand out to 12K. So the market is effectively cut off. The market is cut off at this level right here. This is the cutoff, 12K. So employers, the consumers of labor, are going to get area A, below the demand curve, above the price line. And then what are what are producers of labor are going to get the workers they're going to get below below the price line above the what supply curve out to 12k which is only what b and d so consumers of labor get a producers of labor get what b and d b and d Okay, notice that B is larger than E. I'll point that out in a minute. B is larger than E. All right, so let's go ahead and scroll down. So, what do consumers of labor get? Remember, consumers of labor are the employers. Producers of labor are the workers. This is backwards, so we have to be careful here. So consumers of labor, labor get A, so they what? They lose B, they lose C, so they lose. Producers of labor get what? Producers of labor get B and D. I showed that earlier, which means producers of labor pick up B, but lose what? Lose lose what? Lose E. Right? Let's go ahead and take a peek. You go, I'm not so sure about that. So, again, consumers get what? A. Producers get B and D. So what do consumers lose? Consumers lose B and C. Producers lose what? Producers lose, they lose what? They lose E. They pick up what? They pick up B, but B is greater than E. All right, so let's go down to our table, and we will summarize that. Notice there's a wealth transfer. There's a wealth transfer from consumers of labor businesses towards whom? Towards producers of labor who are workers. But these these are, keep in mind who these workers are. These are probably not disadvantaged workers. These are kids who have connections. Younger people probably who have connections who know somebody who will hire them at 11. So the effect here is plus B minus E, but B is greater than E in terms of area so those kids who find work at 11 win. They win. And society ends up with what? A, B, and D, which means society loses what? Society loses C and E, which means society loses. Again, this area here has got a name. It's called a dead weight. dead weight, loss. And again, this is loss, societal, surplus. This is welfare that's been lost. Okay? So if we go back up to the diagram, let's do that. we can see that the market is cut off. It's Where is it cut off? It's cut off at 12K. So this area here, C 
and E is loss. This area is called the dead weight loss. And again, that's basically a loss of societal welfare due to underproduction, under hiring. So the market should be producing at LE. It's only producing at LD. This is the number of lost, lost jobs. Okay, lost jobs. And again, um, the minimum wage doesn't impact most workers in the United States. Um, most workers, in this case, would, if you look at most U.S. workers, uh, wage earners, they make 11 or more. So if you look at Bureau of Labor Statistics data, you'll see that uh, most, far and away, most workers make more than $11 an hour. Um, but there is a, a segment of the labor force, primarily unskilled, generally single, uh, and generally fairly young, 25 or under, who may earn less than 11. And these are going to be the people who are most negatively impacted by a minimum wage. The interesting thing is, um, is what this really does is it erects, an, uh, erects an, uh, excuse me, erects a barrier uh, for people to find their first job. Uh, the first job is one of the hardest to find. Uh, you've got to somehow make a case to an employer that with no work experience, you can do something meaningful in a profit-making uh, business. In other words, you can contribute value to the output. And that's a pretty hard case at 15 years old, 16 year old, 17 year olds old. Uh, what a 15 year old, 16 year old, 17, 18 year old can do in most businesses is fairly limited. And that, again, is not to put anyone down or disparage anyone. It's just the fact that until you get work experience and learn how to conduct yourself in, in a business, uh, you're not that valuable to the business. And so businesses generally don't want to pay people who are relatively low-valued much. They're, they're really low-valued and relatively high-risk, you know, entrusting capital equipment or entrusting one's personal assets to a teenager is sometimes not a very encouraging thought for business people. So the minimum wage actually makes it much more difficult for employers to want to pull the, the trigger in terms of hiring additional unskilled teenage labor and makes it much harder uh, for, for those people in that category to find work. So if you can't find your first job, uh, it's impossible to find your second, third, and so on. So on that first job, most people learn some very basic skills, you know, how to get to work on time, how to, how to conduct themselves in a business setting, how to speak, how to not speak, when to talk, when not to talk, um, you know, how to, work with, uh, how to work with bosses, how to work with peers. These are very, very important skills, and, and attitudes are formed in, in, in a person's early work career. Uh, when students have a hard time finding work while they're in school, either as high schoolers or college students, it makes it very difficult for them to find work once they get out of college. Okay, it becomes increasingly difficult. Okay, so that concludes uh, our discussion of the minimum wage, uh, a very, very good example of what we call a price floor. And as you can see, such a price floor distorts uh, the market, in this case, the market for unskilled teenage labor.